Let's take a few minutes to look at some of the concluding comments in the Cognitive and Knowledge Development chapter for Piaget. Um, we want to look first at some criticisms of genetic epistemology. Remember, genetic epistemology is Piaget's uh, general theory, description of his general theory, and there's four different criticisms of his approach. The first is Piaget's claim that the sequence of stages is invariant. And some research suggests that this is not the case. And when we say invariant, we're talking about kids going through all the stages in the same order, but also going through all stages. And there's some research that shows that some cultures, some ki children in some cultures do pass through the stages as Piaget suggested. But there's also research that shows that this really varies from culture to culture and that many people never reach formal operations. And in fact, we even see that in the United States. We see that in our culture. And we find that a lot of times people operate at concrete operations rather than at formal. There's a lot of people who never really operate in the formal operational stage in many tasks. Now, we may operate in the formal operational stage in things that we know a lot about and a lot of problem-solving sorts of tasks in areas that are very familiar to us. Um, I can think fairly abstractly about learning theory, about behaviorism in particular, about assessment. But there are other areas where I would need a very concrete representation. For example, if I'm dealing with a computer, I need a tutorial. I need somebody to show me step-by-step step how to do a new task until I've mastered some of that. Okay, so, um, and, and in fact, I'm sorry, the, the, the sequence of stages tends to be sort of a more gradual progression than Piaget thought, and that leads us into the next uh, criticism. Piaget suggested that the, change, the stages represent qualitative changes in cognition. And if we're talking about um, a qualitative change, there's two different implications of this. First, that we have discrete stages and that development is discontinuous. So discontinuous is this notion that we um, think in one way and then we sort of have a jump till we think in the next way and a jump till we think in the next way. And when I say way, <clears throat> I mean the thought characteristics that Piaget talks about with that um, pre-operational, concrete operational, etc. Well, the al alternative to that is the development is more continuous where it's more sort of a gradual upward slope. And so research is suggesting that maybe um, development is a little more continuous than Piaget thought. One uh, set of studies shows that if you try to train children to do the tasks that Piaget presented to them, in fact, they can do better than if you just give them the task without any training. And so this suggests that we can speed up children's development or help it along by prompting them, by teaching them how to think about particular tasks. Conservation tasks are not all mastered at the same time. We only looked at a couple of different con conservation tasks in the video. We looked at the conservation of number, which was that coin task where the coins became more spread out, right? And then there was also the conservation of volume tasks, the, the water in the cup. But there's other conservation tasks, and it shows that children don't master all of these tasks at the same time. They're not reasoning consistently across tasks. Also, research shows that children may show some cognitive strengths that maybe we weren't expecting in uh, certain tasks that we give them. So this research suggests that really all these stages that Piaget proposed may be just an artifact of the tasks that Piaget gave children, that if he had given children different tasks, he might have come up with different views of their thinking. Okay? Not to say that his research wasn't good or that he didn't produce a good theory, just there's some criticisms of the way. Another claim of Piaget's theory is that children exhibit the characteristics of each stage. And what this means is that ki children integrate all the characteristics of a previous stage into the stage that they're currently in. And this is a little bit difficult to test. Another claim is that children exhibit the characteristics of each stage. So Piaget's hierarchy suggests that as we are in this stage, we not only are able to do the tasks in this stage, but we're also able to do the tasks that we could do in this stage. And the question, and, and it's a little bit difficult to see if we can um, integrate all the characteristics of one stage into the next, but what we can do is look to see if, if the traits are an adequate description at a particular stage. And one of the, some more recent research suggests that children don't necessarily think consistently across stages and therefore the way Piaget characterized the stages may need to be called into question a little bit. So for example, let's look at egocentrism, okay? Egocentrism whoops, is this idea that kids are really only focused on their own perspective. And egocentrism is what we see in the Three Mountains experiment that was shown in one of our video clips, all right? 
that one where the little boy was looking at the um, scene and he described accurately what he saw, then he switched sides of the table, he still described accurately what he saw, but when he was asked to tell what the adult saw, he described what he saw, not what she saw, even though he had just been over there to see that. And Reece Piaget said that children are egocentric. Well, children, in fact, are not egocentric for all tasks. They may exhibit egocentrism in that three mountains task, but in fact, when you ask children to do other tasks, we see some evidence of egocentrism and some evidence that it doesn't exist. There's a task known as a referential communication task where you have um, a set of objects and maybe whatever these objects are, and a child is trying to describe these objects so that another child can choose the one that they're referring to. Children don't do very well on that task at young ages. They're also egocentric there. They give information that indicates that they know what they're talking about. And you may have had this experience maybe talking on the phone with a young child and you say, what are you doing? And they say this, they can see it, you can't. But in fact, when you ask a child to show you a picture that they're drawing or when they just show you the picture, let's say that you're the adult, you're standing over here, okay? And the child is over here, okay? They're smaller. Children will in fact angle show you that picture in the orientation that it's the right way for you rather than the right way for them. If a child were egocentric, we would expect them to show the picture with the tree right side up for the child. So when it's something that's very important to them, they appear to lose some of their egocentrism. There's also the claim that global restructuring characterizes the shift from stage to stage, and what we mean by this is that there's a huge amount of restructuring that explains why we move from one stage to the next. And in fact, research is suggesting that that's really not what's going on, that in fact restructuring occurs because of increases in knowledge, and that as children just know more, as they learn more, they actually can do more complex tax tasks. It's not just this huge restructuring. So there's a lot of question about um, some of Piaget's initial claims, but he still did groundbreaking research in recognizing that children are not just many adults, and they do in fact think differently than adults do. So let's look at some alternative perspectives on cognitive development. And your book goes through about five of those, and we're not going to talk about the computational model, but we will talk a little bit about the Neo-Piagetian approach. Neo-Piagetian view is credited with, to Robbie Case, and Case started looking at information processing as part of development, all right, remember the information processing model way back there in Chapter 3, cognitive information processing, computer metaphor, etc. And Case said we can't just explain children um, purely on the basis of just developmental change um, unless we look at mental structures. And he says what happens, what Case really looked at is the differences in children's development related to operating space and storage space. Okay. And when we talk about operating space, we're talking about the space you need to do a task. And he said four-year-olds, in order to do a, a somewhat complex task, need all of their working memory to be used as operating space. But if you look at a six-year-old, operating space is less important, and kids can use storage space. They have now some of their working memory devoted to storage, which means, sorry, that um, they can do more complex tasks because they can start storing information. So they can operate, it on, operate on it in one part of working memory, they can store it in the other part. Well, what, in, what accounts for this change in the ability to store information as well as operate on it? It's just practice and automaticity. And we talked about automaticity some also in Chapter 3. So Kay says as children become more sophisticated processors, they actually can, um, this accounts for part of their development. Okay. He also says that myelinization is part of what occurs for the developmental change, and that's just more development of the nervous system. All right. <clears throat> Sternberg came up with what he called the componential analysis. And Sternberg was interested in looking at intelligence, and he said that there's components of intelligence. There's, there's different aspects of, of intelligence. It's not just one um, thing. So he started looking at development as similar to an ex, a novice becoming an expert. He said development had to do with a novice to expert transition. 
And he says that as we become experts, there are different um, aspects of our intelligence that are operating that influence this novice to expert transi tra transition. And these are described in detail on page 208 of your text. But he talked about meta components, performance components, and knowledge acquisition components. He says meta components are those things that allow you to think about your thought processes. Performance components are the parts of your thought that allow you to actually solve a problem. And um, the knowledge components, or knowledge acquisition components rather, are the th thought process that allow you to gather new knowledge, gather new information that will allow you to go in and solve your problem, do the procedures you need to solve your problem. So let's look at that as an example. Let's say you have to write some sort of an English paper for your English class, and you've got to communicate whatever it is, you've got to choose a thesis statement, choose a topic, and then write a paper. And you decide that you want to argue for a particular point. So you decide, hmm, what kind of paper would be best suited to argue for this sort of point? And, and, and what do I need to do to best present my thesis? And that means that you're trying <clears throat> to choose your type of paper, you're trying to think through your thought processes, and so that might be a meta component. Now you actually try to figure out, and, and you decide to write a persuasive paper. Now you've got to figure out how to gather all the evidence together to make, to write a good persuasive paper. That would be a performance co component. And then as you try to identify which particular pieces of information are best suited to go into your paper as you're reading papers and you're marking things, all that reading is a knowledge acquisition perform, um, component, and then trying to decide which pieces of, of other people's papers to incorporate into yours goes back to that performance component. All right. So as we become more skilled at these diff at working with these different components, we actually see some developmental change. And the, there are several processes that are important to uh, contribute to developmental change. One is feedback, and that's where we start learning how to use our skills more um, effectively, and we realize we're becoming more skilled, and so we continue to do those same tasks. There's also self-monitoring, which is our ability to uh, observe ourselves in action and to figure out if we're using effective strategies. And finally, automa automatization, back up here, like automaticity that Case talked about. Sternberg also talks about it. And he says that as we become more skilled in a task, we do that task more automatically, which uh, makes us look more sophisticated in our approach to doing the task. There's a framework theory approach. I won't say a lot about this, but the idea is that, that um, Piaget thought that children were consistent in their thinking about tasks within a particular stage. And framework theory approach says, nope, the consistency isn't necessarily there. And we do, um, kids start off with some different conceptual structures, and that these change over time. And they change because of development and learning, that we, in fact, can teach children things that help them to change their developmental perspective and to change the frameworks they use. And finally, there was some research on variability, choice, and change, and this is a lot of information that's sort of been pulled together and, and clustered in one section in your text. But the um, idea here is that we children can't do vary in their approaches to things. They can make choices, and we can promote cognitive change. So instruction can facilitate cognitive change, and this is very inconsistent with Piaget's approach. Piaget says, no, development drives instruction. Well. This research suggests that instruction can drive development, that we can teach in such a way to further children's development. Okay? And if we are teaching in a way that might further children's development, what we might see is that we can um, help see new patterns of thinking. We can promote new patterns of thinking in children. And Sigler did some research on how children encoded features of a problem and selected rules to solve the problem. So he looked at problems and rules used to solve them. And he found out that kids could vary the rules that they used based on the problems that they had to solve, which again is inconsistent with Piaget's theory because he would say no matter what kind of problem that you give a child in a particular stage, they're going to always use the same rules because they think the same way, they think consistently about a variety of problems. Okay. So what does all of this mean? Let's look at the implications for instruction in Piagetian inspired instruction. First of all, Piaget suggests that children, if, they're plant, if their minds are planted in fertile soil, their minds will just grow and develop like a plant. All right. So um, he didn't think that we needed to do a whole lot to sort of push children along except for give them an enriched, good environment in which to work. All right. 
we should support the activity of a child according to Piaget. Children are going to be active, they want to engage in things, give them toys, give them things that they can play with that interest them, that supports the activity in which they're engaged. At one point when my daughter was very young, she was interested in containers, just wanted to play with containers. So I pulled out a bunch of containers in my kitchen and for some reason one of the things she latched onto was a trial size bottle of baby shampoo. The baby, the shampoo was out but we still had the containers she used to play with in the bathtub. She carried that thing around for weeks, I don't know why, and she would put it in containers and play with it in the bathtub and then take it out of containers in the kitchen and toss it around. And so I just let her play with that because that was the activity that she wanted to be engaged in, was exploring with that particular container. All right, so we need to support the activity of the child and that will promote learning. Okay. Piaget also suggests that interaction with peers is very important for development. So we need to give kids plenty of time to interact with their peers in order to help them develop. They can't just develop in isolation. They need to learn through social interaction. And they'll learn not only social skills, but also academic skills. Piaget also said that we need to make children aware of conflicts and inconsistencies in their thought. When children are struggling with something, when something seems to not um, work, and um, or, or they, they're making an argument for something that's inconsistent, we need to make them aware of that and say, well, well, how do you think this might work? And I'll give you an example right now. I have, as I told you, I have teenagers. And when my children come home and they say, um, so-and-so did this to me and it upset me and I said this and I said that, then they got mad and they were all at fault. I'll try to take them through the inconsistencies. Well, what might you have said that might have upset that person? How was your response to them, um, which wasn't very kind, inconsistent with what you expect from them. They gave you an unkind response, well you gave them an unkind response. So you're expecting differently from you than you are from them. Trying to help them understand that cons inconsistency to help them think through and problem solve and interact with their peers in a, in a more appropriate and productive manner. That's just one example, but there's lots of examples related to academics as well that we could come up with. Okay. So, instructional implications of an information processing view. This is consistent with more of Case and with Sigler. Um, one of the things we need to think about is how do rules play into children's thinking, and we need to be aware that short-term memory limits have capacity, have short-term memory has capacity limits, so kids tend to oversimplify. So what do we do? We give them small amounts of information to work with at one time. We give them small chunks so that they can have little bits of information and rather than just oversimplifying they can work through what they have and use it as effectively as possible. The other thing that information processing theorists suggest is that children learn best from experiences that induce cognitive conflict. This is sort of what Piaget talked about when he was mentioning pointing out inconsistencies and if we really want children to learn we need to give them things that seem inconsistent and help them learn from those experiences. Um, so maybe they think that all heavy things are going to sink and light things are going to float. Well, if we can give them a piece of wood, for example, that's fairly heavy, wood tends to float, and we can then start doing investigations of why does this wood float rather than sink, and we can get into discussions of density and promote that conceptual change, that understanding, by helping them to explore their cognitive conflicts.